Hello, Blenders, and welcome, welcome to episode number 123 of Real Blend, a podcast that values its neck a lot more than $3,000, Chief. We'll find him for three, but we'll catch him, and we'll kill him for ten. My name is Sean O'Connell, the managing director here at Cinema Blend. Kevin's trying to piece it together. Did you get it? I did not get it. Uh, J- Jake knows it. It's Quinn from from uh, from Jaws. Quinn. Oh yeah, from Jaws. Let me we'll, ca- we'll catch him. I can't do the accent, and we'll kill him <laughs> for ten. I value my neck a lot more than three thousand dollars, Chief. Now that oh, I would have known. That you would have known. That I would have known. <laughs> Let's start it over. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Ah. Uh, Hi, everyone. Well, welcome to Real Blood episode highlights. Um, we're going to do our favorite movies of 2020 so far. We're going to give you our, our top three and what has been a very strange year for movie going. But we found a couple of gems uh, later on. We're going to talk about Jon Stewart's new film, Irresistible, a political comedy from the mind of uh, The Daily Show's former host. Uh, but before we get into all of that, let me introduce the guys. I'm going to start with Kevin McCarthy, who is making me feel pretty bad about wearing a Spider-Man T-shirt to the <laughs> podcast because he has upped his game severely for the YouTube audience. Hi, Kevin. How are you? Well, good. Good to talk to you, Sean. Jake. Yes. Gabe. Uh, I'm wearing this because I was I, I did the morning show and I've had interviews throughout the day. So I just haven't changed. This is just lazy. You look fantastic. Thank you. Uh, as does Jake Hamilton of Fox 32 in Chicago. Hi, I Jake. had my morning show and also interviews throughout the day, and this is what <laughs> this is what I wear. So I don't know what my excuse is. Well, um, plugs. Let's get to plugs. A reminder that we oh we have exciting news today too uh, that we will get to in a second. A reminder that we have a community page over on Facebook. Uh, there's always a ton of really great conversations happening over there. The Blender family is growing on the regular, so if you want to head over to Facebook and search for Real Blend Podcast Community, we are also posting these episodes on Cinema Blend's YouTube page, as uh, some of you might be watching. I think it's really fun too because. Uh, We will post the audio when the podcast drops on social media, and then some people will say, I've seen this comment. Oh, cool. I can't wait to watch it on YouTube later on. So that's working and continue to do that. Uh, Also, Sean, note that you put content up every week. Yes, I do put content up on the YouTube page. Wait, are these uh, notes that you read yourself? Yes. (laughs) Post-it notes to remind myself that you're special. And, and gosh darn it, people like gosh darn it, people like you. And things are going to go your way someday, son. Uh, and of course, we are available all the places where you can get your favorite podcasts, uh, all the apps that you can use to down. I'm, thinking, I'm bailing out of this. That That is worded so poorly, Gabe, that uh, every time I get to it each week, I get tripped up because of the way that it's like, just get us where you download podcasts, right? It should just say that in the notes. Get us where you download. That works podcasts. for me. Thank you. Good. Very that nice. works for me. Uh, here's the exciting news. The merch store that we teased in last week's episode is now currently available. Uh, you can find T-shirts, mugs, and stickers over on cinemablend.com backslash shop. And you can check out some of the new and very cool Real Blend merchandise uh, that people have been asking us for. So uh, head on over there. Check out the shirts and the mugs. Oh, Kevin's drinking from a mug right now. I hope next week or some week soon it'll be a Real Blend mug. It says and, Jake's uh, Takes. Nice. Oh, good day, Chicago. And I've got my I got a big water, which makes a lot of noise with the ice for poor Gabe this, this, to have to edit out. Later it says on. today is your day. That's the, uh... <laughs> See, we are full of uh, inspirational <laughs> slogans this week. We're boosting everybody's morale. Uh, let's get to the weekly poll really quickly. So uh, in honor of the fact that we are doing the top three movies of the year so far, we asked everybody what their best movie of the year has been. Kevin, yes. I have a question real fast, only because oh. I have ADD. I have ADD. The yes. Jaws, the Jaws joke you did at the beginning of the show, was that because of yep. the 45th anniversary? Was there a reason for it? Well, yeah, there's a lot of reasons for it. Yes, it's the 45th anniversary. Um, it's also because on Father's Day this past Sunday, I decided to marathon a couple of movies that featured uh, New York cops in honor of my, because my father was a retired New York City police, dep- uh, police officer. So I watched mm. that. I watched Serpico, and then I ended it with um, John McClane, my favorite. And I watched with a vengeance also, because it's New York Cup in New York. So that was a whole Father's Day thing. But then also, Kevin, this is a really great tease. Jaws is going to turn up later on in the uh, show, I think. Is Jaws one of the ones, Jake, or no? The number one movies? No? That you teased? Maybe? All right. This is a, this is a tease that we... So yes, there's a reason why I did Jaws, and it's multi-layered. It's an Inception joke. 
that will make sense yeah. as the episode goes on. So thank you I for wanted asking. To you know that. how jokes are good. How jokes are good is whenever you have to like really explain no, them. I understand well, why Kevin would ask that. I wanted context as to yes. why there was a Jaws quote. That's why you I know, wasn't ready for it. And while we're on the, the matter of this, because I've like painted myself into this corner of having to come up with a joke for the beginning of every episode. And, and I really do it just to see if I can make you two laugh. But do, people who are listening to the show, please let me know via social media whether like it's whether it works at all. <laughs> because I kind of oh, think, you have to keep doing it. I will quit this show if you stop but, with the with but the opening sometimes joke. Sometimes they're like inside jokes for us, and people might not understand the context. This entire like, show is an inside <laughs> joke for us. <laughs> yes, yeah, kind of true. But I wonder if like they hear like why did he do a Jaws uh, reference or why did he do some such thing? Kevin, you are the voice of the people when you stop and ask. Uh, why I did the, why I did what I did at the beginning of the show. All right, weekly poll. We asked everybody what the best movie they've seen so far this year. We saw a lot of love for Guy Ritchie's film The Gentleman. We saw a lot of love for Spike Lee's The Five Bloods. The Five Bloods. Some people caught up with releases from last year, and they chose 1917. Uh, Sam Mendes, Mendes, who uh, pronounces it Dunkirk, which I'll never Dunkirk. not love. <laughs> Uh, a lot of people caught up with Parasite and some recent love for the Michael B. Jordan, Jamie Foxx film, Just Mercy. The Invisible Man was heavily represented. And then Jacob Juice from Holland says that they started opening theaters uh, in June. So I guess there's going to be some more stuff coming. Uh, wait, Gabe is going to type. You could just say it, Gabe. Remember, you have a mic now. Uh, I'll get back to you. I forgot to finish typing. Oh, <laughs> Why do I rely on these notes? All right. Well, Gabe is finishing up the weekly poll and we will get to again later on in the show what our uh, three best films that we've seen so far this year. And that will allow Jake and Kevin to weigh in with their choices and, and me also, too. But for this, I want to throw to Jake to start off our talking points. Michael Keaton returning to play Batman slash Bruce Wayne in the rumored Andy Muschietti uh, Flash movie, which is going to be Flashpoint. Uh, Jake, your reaction to your favorite Batman. He's your favorite Batman, isn't he? Yeah, Keaton is my favorite Batman. I, okay. I do love. I, now, Bale is in my favorite Batman movies, right. but Keaton is my favorite Batman. So, um, how do you feel about him coming back? Oh, I, I am. I mean, one of the, the general concern. First of all, before I get into it, can you tell the story? Can you tell our oh, or yeah. Andy story? Yeah, because like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I feel like that sets the moment. All right, so we're in um, London for the Birds of Prey junket, and we were coming back from the roller a skate party right Correct. weren't we coming yeah. back from that Correct. Uh, yeah. they set up a roller skate party for the Birds of Prey junket and it was um, it was an open bar and you could skate and this is where for people who follow me on the Snyder Cut story this is where I met Jim Lee uh, from DC and walked over to talk to him about the Snyder Cut and we were coming back from that event and walking into our hotel and that hotel that we stayed in in London we're normally very very lucky to stay in some of the most beautiful hotels um, on earth like places you would never dream of being able to go into and we wouldn't if studios didn't um allow us to go there and this one in london was over the top luxurious and to the point that as we were going in because later was it on that same trip that you saw robert pattinson yeah i ran into pattinson <laughs> coming back from shooting the batman who was shooting the batman and Did you we have saw a good time running into him <laughs> it, was right it was around, it was, twi it was around twilight around twilight yeah good yeah. call this, um this we Sunday saw Andy Muschietti, who and Muschietti has come by the uh, Cinema Blend interview suite at San Diego Comic-Con two years in a row for it. First for the first it and then for it chapter two. So I know him pretty well. I've interviewed him a couple of times. He's always been really nice. He's hung around the suite and talked to us a bunch. And um, he was outside of the hotel that we were heading back to catching a cigarette really fast. And we did that thing where you lock eyes with somebody and you're like, I know you. And then it's like, oh, yeah, yeah. it's Andy Muschietti. And he says, yeah, I'm in town. I'm, I'm and it working. was just us. Like, it, it was great because, like, we weren't surrounded by, like, I almost would argue if we, if we were, like, in a group of, like, 10 junket people, I yeah. just would have, like, said, okay, let's just keep going. But it was just you and me. Yeah. So we stopped and talked to him for a bit. Yeah. And, and he said, oh, yeah, I'm here working on the script for uh, The Flash. And he mentioned someone, who, Christina Hodgson, I think it is, a girl who wrote mm -hmm. Bumblebee. I think yeah. she's working on that with him. And so she was in London also. And... I said, oh, that's right. You're doing Flash and it's going to be a Flashpoint story. And he was, you know, not giving up very many details. And I said, look, hey, are you going to bring back Jeffrey Dean Morgan? Because the the whole knock on Flashpoint or the story of Flashpoint is when Flash goes back and resets the timeline by saving his parents um, from getting killed. When he returns to the alternate universe, he's in a new timeline where uh, the the Batman 
parents uh, getting murdered in the alley scene is changed in that Bruce dies. The kid dies and Bruce's parents go on to become the father. Thomas Wayne becomes Batman and wow, the mother. That's cool. The mother goes insane. Martha Wayne goes insane from seeing her kid murdered in the alley and she becomes the Joker. Um, and that's what that's how it plays out in the Flashpoint story. I've never story. heard this. This is, oh, yeah, yeah. Um, dude, it's nuts. Yeah, what yeah. a cool it's concept. Nuts. Yeah, I so love it. It's also a great way for DC to like, I don't want to say fix, yeah. but like fix any story issues they have right now. Sure. That's and awesome. Y- you got to assume like if you want to look at what Zach did in casting those two parents, he puts Jeffrey Dean Morgan and Lauren Cohen from The Walking Dead in, you know, parts that have no uh, dialogue at all. <laughs> You know, they're on screen for half a minute, essentially, just to get kills flying. Yeah. <laughs> Always. But why Always would you pearls. cast them unless you wanted to maybe potentially use them later in a Flashpoint movie? So the audience was uh, well, this fan base is pretty uh, excited about the potential of Jeffrey Dean Morgan, who also worked with Zach on Watchmen, obviously played the comedian. And uh, I mentioned to Andy, I was like, well, you're going to bring uh, him back to play Thomas Wayne. And Andy kind of smiled at us and he said, actually, we have a. We have a different idea for that, um, but didn't want to tell me what it was. And I was like, okay, cool, man. I'm not going to press you. I'm not trying to get any kind of scoops out of you. This was just a cool sort of run in type thing. And now here this story breaks that Mm -hmm. they want to bring Keaton back for it. And uh, but it's not that wouldn't be a traditional Flashpoint story because I don't think like he's not going to play Thomas Wayne. It's just going to set up a multiverse where Flash somehow it has to interact with. 89 Batman. Because yeah. keep just in mind, he's older. already met uh, TV's, TV's The Flash. He did, yes, yeah. on, on the television yeah. show yeah. last year. They did a multiverse thing. So yeah. um, so they've kind of already started laying the groundwork. I, I don't know. I, I I think that is such a brilliant idea because because I've been reading that like it's going to be more less, not saying that Keaton's not going to suit up because why would you bring him back if he's not going to suit up at, at all? Sure. But less of like a Batman role and more of like kind of the Nick Fury of the DCU which I think is such a brilliant idea. I think Keaton is so fantastic in that role. Um, he seems to have really owned it over the last like three decades. Mm. He seems, like he's not one of those guys that like hates it and doesn't want to talk about it. Like he's like, you can just tell in interviews when someone asks about it, like he's still jacked about it. Um, I, I would argue that I think Batman, like outside of the Nolan trilogy, I think Batman returns is probably the best Batman movie. I think, you know, I, I just think it's brilliant. Also then again, if those movies are Canon, does mm. that mean that Pfeiffer could come back as Catwoman? Sure. Yeah. Because because uh, I'm trying to think is because the Penguin died, right? Joker died. Penguin died. Yeah. And then Max Max Shrek died. Yeah. Um, but I would love to see Pfeiffer come back. But I think Selena Kyle lives. She also looks exactly like she did. She looks the exact same. Too. Yeah. Uh, I would. And I actually think she this maybe this is a hot take. She deserved an Oscar nomination as Catwoman. She That's was interesting. Brilliant. I thought she was brilliant. I thought Danny DeVito was brilliant. Um, I, well, I'm let me throw it to, I want to throw it to Kevin yeah. really quick for yeah. a cautious, uh, a cautious take on this, because here we are bringing back a, a hero of ours who uh, is playing a role that made him famous or, or one of the ones that made him famous. Michael Keaton would have been famous regardless. Kevin has watched Arnold Schwarzenegger return to the Terminator franchise. <laughs> Ooh, great <laughs> point. Great point. <laughs> a lot. So does that give you any pause, Kev? <laughs> I mean, it's an interesting question. Um, I think the only difference between Arnold and and uh, Keaton is that the character of Batman was has been played by different people throughout that, mm. the, the time since, since he left the character. So, like, it's almost like it's a homecoming versus like, I don't know, Arnold returning to Terminator felt like a cash grab. Mm. Um, bec- and, and but because there have been other Batman movies and Keaton returning just feels more like a homecoming and more of like a warm blanket right to the to the hey. to the universe of batman um for me it's interesting i always find batman discussions very interesting because you always have to preface what you want to say about your batmans um like people will say like my favorite batman best batman um and i've always found it interesting because i think keaton it, it, there's like three or four ways you can look at it keaton is like an incredible batman and bruce wayne as mm-hmm. was affleck affleck was a great batman and a great bruce wayne um, I don't love Bale's Batman uh, because of the voice primarily, but I do think his Bruce Wayne was the best Bruce Wayne ever put to camera. Um, but Keaton kind of has that flow where he's perfect at both. They're 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 two different characters. I mean, you got to play them differently. Batman and Bruce Wayne are almost two completely different characters, almost more so than Clark Kent and Superman. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I find the divide between them 
not as heavy as the divide between Batman and Bruce Wayne. I find that to be a different divide personally. Um, I love when it? Bale played, whenever Bale played uh, Bruce Wayne, he was such a jerk. You know, he was such a, a, yeah. a spoiled rich kid, right? In all of the scenes where he showed up, like purposely, you know? Like yeah, falling into he, the fountain in the restaurant with the girls yeah. and all that Walking stuff. Walking into a room. He always had like three or four girls. Yeah. Like when, like he pro- probably genuinely couldn't have cared less because they all he did was love Rachel. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Rachel. I mean, I'm interested in Keaton returning only because he is. I mean, I, I, I still feel like Affleck is to, to this date my favorite Batman to ever grace the screen. I, st- I still think the warehouse wow. scene and the nightmare sequence are the best versions of Batman. But I also love that Frank Miller esque, very dark, very dark Batman storylines. Right. I, I think that Miller. So that's probably why I'm attracted to that. I also really I discovered Frank Miller when I saw Sin City for the first time. I, I was not a comic book reader growing up. I had certain comics, but I never had Sin City. So when I f- developed his style watching Sin City, then when I saw what Snyder did with Affleck in BVS, it just kind of like me- it like melted these two worlds together that I that I absolutely loved. Um, and I think to this day, my favorite shot of Batman ever is the shot in BVS. I think, is it the scene where Batman's like over that edge and it's like the look up shot with the rain coming down and the, and the lights oh, on that's his, a cool shot on the gargoyle. That, it's oh, so Frank yeah, Miller. Yeah, I, I, I don't, yeah. It's so Frank Miller. Like, I, I just love that moment. So I, I know I'm deter, deterring from your question, but in regards to Keaton returning, I, I, I think it's a different situation than Arnold returning to Terminator. Um, I think I'm actually more excited about it. I was excited about Arnold returning to Terminator two or three or four times uh, until I saw the movies. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Cause, cause to your point, I think like Schwarzenegger returning almost felt like, well, I've made a few other movies and they haven't done well. So like, mm. let me go back to the well and give people what I know, as opposed to like Keaton has done just fine outside. Yeah. Like he doesn't oh, need yeah. to return to Batman. So the fact that like they must've presented, cause, cause remember like he, they wanted him back for Batman three for Batman forever. And he didn't like the direction Schumacher was going to take it. Um, and so like clearly like he knows to turn down Batman when it's not good. So I'm mm-hmm. thinking they must have presented him with, with something awesome. I have a question for you guys. If this sort of flashpoint scenario if Keaton's role is like bigger than just like a 30 second cameo as he runs through time or whatever. Does does this open up the possibility if, the, if they're going to sort of embrace that multiverse of Batons of, of Pattinson's Batman becoming the new Justice League Batman, like of just tying those worlds together so that we can logically not have to worry about Ben Affleck. It's interesting. I mean, does it solve that problem? It, my mind hurts. It could, Yes, it could <laughs> solve that problem. God. But I really think Matt Reeves just wants his his films to be separate from all that. Um, and it's it would be confusing for Warner Brothers to have uh, an existing universe going on, but then have one of your main characters of that universe doing his own trilogy someplace else. I don't know, it's weird. It's weird because it's almost like they wanted to set up the shared universe similar to what the MCU had. Then they kind of decided to pull it apart and let everybody do their own thing. So Gal Gadot is able to do different Wonder Woman movies. Jason Momoa is able to do. And now they're. it seems like they're inching back toward putting it back together somehow because Ray Fisher potentially is going to show up in the Flash movie as Cyborg. And, you know, Oh, I don't I don't know any other ties that they're potentially going to be doing. I don't know. That's a really great question. I like you, also, too, that, you know, they set up the potential of doing a Batman Beyond, which is a very popular animated series where Bruce Wayne was older and retired and mentored um, Terry McGinnis, who became the second Batman in a more uh, high tech suit. And yes, they could go that direction, too. But I think Warner Brothers biggest fear is that they overpromise things you know they just keep saying oh and then we'll do this and then we'll do this and then they should just let it play out first like let us breathe about the fact that you're bringing keaton back that's cool let us enjoy that i feel like keaton kind of already returned as batman a little bit in birdman a little bit we got to kind of see him play with that that vibe again you know what i mean it was kind of a cool and, and and again with his current age which is obviously older than he was when he played batman to see him back in a suit like that Yep. Um, was it, it still worked like I mean it was I and mean, it's weird I, I always wanted to ask in Yuritu Gonzalez about that aspect and whether or not he was concerned about people making that connection like was it too close to Batman um because it was like and I wondered oh, but, yeah. but I almost feel like do you feel like he was definitely nodding towards Batman in the sense of like oh yeah but, well that's but, why it's someone pointed out the fact that like he does Birdman the whole message of that is like franchises are bad and these yeah. characters uh, weigh down on you and since then 
Keaton has done Spider-Man: Robo Homecoming. Cop. Yeah, he was in Dumbo. He did. Was he in that RoboCop? Yeah. Yeah. Oh God. Uh, he was in uh, Spider-Man: Homecoming. He did the Dumbo remake. He's going to be in uh, Morbius. He showed up at the end credits of Morbius. <laughs> so yeah. I, so do you think right now Marvel is looking at all their Spider-Man going oh, like, hmm, yeah, okay. So do can we, we talk about that? Do we do this? I think. Remember, remember, I asked Tom Holland about it in London. And he was like very much like, yes, I want to do this. I think it, that they were going to do that. Is it blasphemous? And you, think, and you think DC beat him to it? Yeah. Is it, is it blasphemous to say that I think the greatest scene Keaton's ever been involved in is the homecoming limo scene? That's a great scene. No, That's I mean, it's an amazing scene. scene. He's been What's in some better tremendous scene? scenes, though. What's well, yeah. a better scene than Keaton's been in? Besides, like, get nuts. Scene. Let's get nuts. From performance, like a performance-wise scene? What a scene. Because that one is great. God, I'll even, I even just th- would throw it back because I watched it again recently. It's one of the ones that I watch over and over again is when Spider-Man shows up in the warehouse after that. And, yes. and he's like, uh, you know, hey, I found you. And he's like, oh, hey, Pete, you know, uh, I can see what Liz sees in you now. You know, yeah. like you really do have that stick to it. And then he's like, why are you uh, essentially saying to Spider-Man? He's like, well, how do you think Tony Stark, you know, got all of his millions? You know, he's yeah. he's just as yeah. bad as the rest of us are. And then they yeah. look down at us. You know, God, we're the ones who are supposed to eat their best table Spider-Man movie ever. Best it's Spider-Man a tremendous movie performance by him. Keaton's performance in that movie is so understated. And like, yeah. I feel like people don't give it enough credit because it's in this big spectacle. Like that performance, that is the grounded element of that entire film. He grounds yeah. it in this yeah. like really nasty, like villain way that feels realistic you know it's very strange because as much as i liked gyllenhaal as mysterio he was a little over the top he he did a little bit of the mustache twirling especially when he played whatever director he was playing i uh, loved that i (laughs) love i i I liked that movie better than homecoming oh i i think far from home is great but i i give homecoming the the edge just slightly all right um we're getting close to uh the release on disney plus of Lin-Manuel Miranda's Hamilton. Alexander Hamilton. So I've never seen it, um, like not at all. And I've only kind of listened to some of the songs. So I'm really excited to see it. And it's it's one of those things where I didn't want to like dip into it or learn one or two of the songs until I was able to see it play out all the way from start to finish. So from that perspective, I'm really, really excited for this to come. You guys are about to do interviews for it, but we learned... Uh, earlier this week that one of the things that we discussed about the censorship of it and whether they're going to censor it uh, or not, Lin-Manuel Miranda has admitted that they uh, took out, so there are three F-bombs in it and they took Mm -hmm. out two. They're going to leave one, which is ludicrous because, so it's okay for a kid to hear one, but if the kid hears two, they're scarred for life. (laughs) That makes no sense to me whatsoever. Even as the parent on the show, that makes no sense to me whatsoever. Uh, But are you guys okay with this? Is Is that fine with you guys? I'll never understand the MPAA. I, I and I, I've to this day I still do not understand their logic. Um, right. You can watch. I mean, one of the movies I always look at when I when I talk about the MPAA is Live Free Die Hard, um, which is such a violent film, but it's PG thirteen, and then they cover up the mother effer line with the with a gunshot yeah. uh, because you can't put the word mother before the f word. But in, you can put a gunshot. <laughs> you can exactly. have him shooting a person. You can shoot somebody, yeah. but you can't say MFR. Right, um, right, right, right. And so <laughs> they have all these weird rules where, like, you can't say the F word in a sexual way. It has to be done in a certain way. So, I, like Sean just said, I've never understood the difference between hearing the word once or 350 times in Pulp Fiction. Like, it, it, it's it's one of those. Remember King's speech? Uh, was it was kind of in the question about this when that got an R rating and there was a few F bombs in there and it was like this historical film. Didn't they release like a, a non R rated cut so like people could go see it that were under? Oh, 17? yes, they did. Yes, they did. And yes. and it was like, what, what? I don't understand. So in this case, we were t- we were texting about this in the text chain. They're going to take out they're going to take away two of the F bombs. And I, I yeah. want to ask Lynn Manuel Miranda how he decided on the one to keep. Because, I mean, if you only have one to keep, you got to make that one powerful. Right, um, right. On that other question. So- on the, thank you. On the other side of this, though, I have a problem with just like the idea of having someone censor their work. And, 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 and this is such an interesting thing because I, I get it. It's Disney. It's PG-13. Disney Plus is a, is a more of a family-friendly platform. Um, but I still don't understand the justification of 
little Johnny sitting on the couch at seven years old, watching Hamilton with his parents, hearing the one F word and then muting the other two. What did that do for that child? I don't nothing. understand. What Absolutely that did. nothing. When, in fact, I'm, I'm here to tell you, as someone who's raising two boys, the, the, the place where they're going to hear swear words is more likely in a song somewhere. At right? Like there are clean versions. Well, of course, at school. Yes. Amongst their friends. Um, there are clean versions of songs, but more often than not, you hear a version of a song that a kid likes for whatever reason. And then it drops an F-bomb in the middle of somewhere. And yeah. Brendan is 12. Right. And he'll look at me like, oh, sorry. You know, and I'm like, well, dude, whatever, whatever we're going to do. Um. But no kid, no young kid is going to sit through a, a history lesson like Hamilton just to maybe hear an F word. They can go to freaking Instagram and hear, yeah. and hear it from anybody. So, Or I, listen to the Hamilton album. Is this more of a MPAA thing, though, or is it a Disney oh. thing? No, I it's think an it's MP, a Disney it's thing. MPA. They got a well, PG-13. Well, MPA, but, I'm, but I think Disney, were the, Disney probably yeah. said you can't. Like, cause, cause the MPAA, that's their rules. Like you can't, like it is what it is. It's been that way for years. Sure. You can't start picking, but, but, but Disney, Disney could have, could have clearly said, you know what? We're going to go ahead and, and make it rated R. We're going to put it on the app anyway. Like they, like they yeah. own it. They can do with it, whatever they choose. And I think so this could have been a great opportunity for them to just not earn like cool credibility, but just say yeah. like, Hey, this is the work. It's intact. It's going into your homes. So parent, you know, yes. if you don't do want you guys, your kids to see it, parent. But here it is. Do you guys remember years ago? I, I, I'll never forget this. And maybe I'm remembering this wrong, even though I just said I'll never forget it, um, which makes no <laughs> sense. It's an oxymoron. Um, yeah. There you go. Uh, years ago, when Schindler's List first went on television, didn't they air the film as is without I think edits? they did. I know they, they had, did that with Saving Private Ryan. They used to do that on Memorial Day. Right. And, and, there was and, like and they a would message. put a, a thing saying, yeah, they would put a thing at the beginning right. saying, look, like it's a Memorial Day. You know, this is a very important film for a lot of reasons. We yeah. don't feel like it's our right to edit it. So we're and this was on ABC. This was like prime time right. on ABC. And they basically mm -hmm. said, like, viewer discretion advised. Isn't that the old saying? Like, yeah. like yeah, yeah, yeah. we're putting it out there. It's on you. But it is not our right to edit this film, which I I, that's that a happening. wonderful point. That's a great. I, why don't they why don't they just do that? Yeah, I remember that happening with Schindler's List. I, and, and like to me, like if I'm Disney Plus, you either one or what if you have Lim Manuel Miranda record an intro right before it starts? Just sure. Hey, everybody out there, um, just a heads up. You might hear some bad language in this show. It's all within a historical context. And I think though that is a much safer route to go. What you're doing here mm -hmm. is you're censoring someone's work with no logical but he reasoning. He allowed it. OK, but well, let's let's get beyond language police because we we dwelt on this topic and uh, and like you said, Jake, he's allowed it. I'm more excited that we're gonna have a a time capsule version of the show mm -hmm. with the original cast because I think Gabe and I were even talking. Gabe, you were waiting for it to come around uh, and play with you, uh, play by you, but that would have been with regional players or with a traveling uh, show. And I don't know if this was always part of their plan. Was it always going to be part of their plan to record a version of it before the original cast broke up? Because there's so many people like that was such a hot ticket and getting into that theater to when see I, that original right. cast. Like now anyone's going to be able to see it anytime. I think that's fantastic. That is when fantastic. Because there are a lot of people that can't like, you know, that unfortunately can't. Like it's tough to get to afford a ticket to Hamilton. And, and you know, yeah. we were I was lucky enough to see it just by nature of, of being a member of the press. Kevin was lucky enough to be, able to, to be able to see it because like Kevin, you saw it with the original cast and like, you know, we're, yeah. we're all very fortunate in that we get to see a lot of stuff um, early and we're very fortunate and that we get to see a lot of stuff for free. But you know, a lot of people out there don't have that luxury. So like that, that's why I'm, I, I'm of two minds about the whole like editing and censorship thing, because like, yes, okay. They cut out two F bombs, but there are a lot of kids out there that, that might not have yeah. been able to see this that now have access to it. And to me, like, I think that is fantastic. Oh, and, and, and that's the silver lining. I completely agree with you. I'd rather have it there than not. No question. Mm -hmm. I just find it to be ridiculous that we're still arguing over two F-bombs versus one F-bomb or the Martian. I remember the Martian didn't Matt Damon have to mouth a couple of the F-bombs in order to get a couple more in there. Um, so what's interesting about the original cast is so Lauren and I got tickets and saw it in New York with the full cast. I remember interviewing Leslie Odom Jr. recently, and he said that the movie was shot, I think, a week before his last show. Mm -hmm. um, so it was almost like and the way they shot this thing. And Jake, I already know you know this. We discussed this earlier. I find it fascinating how they filmed it. And Sean, do you know the details of how they shot this thing? 
All I saw was a trailer. Um, so, so I kind of got a sense of the visual of it. So basically what they did was, and this is Lynn Manuel Miranda is explaining this today in an interview. Um, uh, they did a show on Sunday, which was their normal, like, you know, they do a normal show on Sunday. I can't remember what day Laura and I saw. It was like a Saturday or Sunday in New York, but we sat in the top. So my, ex- my perspective of that show was the top balcony of the theater, which mm-hmm. was still the greatest musical and show I've ever seen. If, on but Broadway. if you're familiar with that show, I would argue um, that that's it's like the, the stage itself is incredible. It is a gorgeous, moving work of art. And and to your credit, like, and I don't mean this is like a humble brag, but whenever I saw it here in Chicago, they gave me seats like on the floor. And I almost like now knowing sort of what the stage does, Kevin, I actually envy your seat because I'd argue you saw a lot more than I did because you saw the ground of the stage, which is itself a work of art. Yeah, I mean, it really was. I and mean, that, that was the thing. When we, and Lauren and I went into that theater and sat down uh, and we bought tickets. We were on this weird cusp where it was very popular, but it hadn't won the Tonys yet. Mm. So the tickets oh, wow. were like their tickets were ridiculously expensive. I think I mean, I feel bad saying this out loud. But I think we spent like five hundred dollars a piece on those tickets or four fifty or something. It was expensive. That's what they were you going saw for, history. though. You know, they went and you way saw history. higher than that, man. They were Did like they really? Over th- thousands later on um and so we got in there in this weird bubble in this cusp um and i we got in saw the show and i'll never forget it because it was it was truly i've been going to broadway shows all my life um fan of the opera i saw the producers with nathan lane and matthew broderick i saw ah. uh you, oh know, yeah, I saw, you and uh, lauren uh, go to a ton of shows like you even we, you know before all this shut down you guys were going to amazing shows it's easy for you to get on the train yeah. and go up there and enjoy like you saw cranston a That's bunch awesome. of times and network yeah. and something else too yeah, I saw Cranston and Network and then the LBJ um, oh, right. show, the one. which we sat front row for, and he was just spinning on us for three hours, which was awesome. But but one of the <laughs> crazy the parts of, of Kevin's life. And I'm like, Heisenberg, spit on me. <laughs> no, no, but, no, I know, but it was it was it was interesting because one of the things about Broadway shows that I've always loved, one of the best shows I ever saw was Bradley Cooper and Elephant Man. Oh, that was like a wow. one essentially a one person show. That was the most insane thing I've ever seen. And then he came out afterwards and took a picture with every single person. He, there's a selfie of Bradley Cooper that, that he took of me, my mom, my dad and Lauren. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's such a great photo. Anyways, that's back, so to, cool. back to Hamilton. But like it was it, it was a remarkable experience. So what how they filmed it, Sean, is really cool. So on a Sunday, they, 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 they did the show in front of an audience and they filmed it with all the cameras. Then when the audience left, they redid some of the scenes closer up that they didn't uh, that they couldn't get maybe with the audience there. Then Monday, they did it again without an audience the day they okay. were off because Broadway's dark on Mondays and they filmed it again. And then I believe Tuesday they did the show one more time with an audience and filmed it again. So I believe the film you're going to watch is an intercutting of two different shows and two non shows. That's and cool. From what I understand and what I can see from the visual perspective of it, like when you're watching a play on stage or a Broadway show or a musical, you know, you don't get the facial expressions. You Mm -hmm. know what I mean? So like if you're if you're far up, I mean, I'm getting the scope of the show and Mm -hmm. Jake's talking about the stage, but I can't wait to get up into like Aaron Burr's face or Alexander Mm -hmm. Hamilton's face and kind of like feel that emotion, especially when he comes out and says my name, you know, I'm Alexander Hamilton. Yeah. Like to, they can release a clip of that today. Just he does. Him. Oh, God. yeah. But he's that Spoiler alert. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, so I, I think it's going to be a really unique experience and I'm actually happy it exists. I'm just I just wish we could see it in its full form. Well, Kevin, I have a question. So you're, you're talking about how they shot it and they obviously they, they shot with with in some it's cases with the audience there. Does that mean that like some people paid a lot of money for a ticket and there were cameras roaming around on stage because yeah. that would annoy the hell. Like if I waited all that time and spent I, all that money and I'm watching and there are people with cameras on stage, that would bug the hell out of me. So what I gathered from Lynn Manuel's answer, this is an, an interview he gave. I think it was on GMA. Um, I think those close up shots you're referring to were shot when there was no audience. So I think that the, makes I think okay. I think the I think the shots of the I think the shows that you're referring to, the two shows they shot at, I guarantee those were just wide shots i don't okay. think the audience but you can't I, mess with people's experience like that no yeah, and that theater is pretty yeah. small isn't it kev yeah it was oh yeah you were basically sitting on top of people like it was yeah, like yeah. i mean I, that's the other thing like i can't imagine going back to a broadway show now in this yeah. in these times like you're literally touching the other person next to you um yeah. but i do think jake to answer your question i think they probably had these wide angle shots 
And then they went in for the that close ups while the audience wasn't there. The one thing that I'm sort of comparing it to is Middle Ditch and Schwartz and Ben Schwartz <laughs> raving about how they uh, got to film that. And then when I watched it, I totally got what he was talking about because yeah. you're right there with them and it followed them through that improv. If you haven't watched those three episodes, too, by the way, they're fantastic. Seriously, everybody out there listening to our show, watch the three episodes of Middle Ditch and Schwartz. It <laughs> is so funny. Some of the most brilliant comedy and acting i have ever seen and i yeah. still have no idea how they do it no yeah. idea uh jake you have something cool you want to mention about the box office yeah you know obviously you know one of the things that that all of us do is talk about you know what's the number one at the box office and um and obviously we just haven't been able to do that for the past few months and i saw this story and talk about warm blankets which is sort of the theme of the show it just sort of made me so happy and i ended up actually getting to cover it on the show today we aired a clip of Jurassic Park and I got to say something that I didn't know I'd ever get to say on television, which is, hey, guys, like number one movie in America is Jurassic mm-hmm. Park. The number two movie in America is Jaws. And it's just because a lot of drive in theaters and a few handful of the few theaters that have opened around the country have been retroactively showing a lot of these movies. And apparently J- uh, Jurassic Park brought in like five hundred and sixty three thousand <laughs> and Jaws brought in like five hundred sixty one thousand, which means that those two movies we're number one and number two at the box office. And I don't know why, but like that just made me so happy. Yeah. And I, just, I like, like awesome. did you ever think you would live in a day where like those were the number one and number two movies at nope. the box office in America? That Steven Spielberg might have a future. At he filmmaking. might do something one day. <laughs> Give him a Jake, dude with a whip and let's see what happens. Jake, are they doing like a double feature thing? Like, like I could imagine like a drive through playing oh, both God. movies. That would be back amazing. Back. That'd be awesome. That would be, I mean, That'd that would be, be awesome. smart. Oh, I mean, I and also question. like, but like, yeah. For Jake, too, um, one of the movies that they are going to reshow is Empire Strikes Back. Would you go mm-hmm. back to watch Empire on the big screen? I mean, I've seen it on the big screen because I saw it when they did the, the special edition re-releases in the late 90s. Okay. Um, I don't know. I, I was telling Kevin earlier today, I really yeah. I know a lot of theaters are going back to the big screen or a lot of movies are going back to the big screen. And it would yeah. be cool to see them for the for, uh, um, on the big screen again. I kind of like the idea of Tenet being my my welcome back. Really? I kind of I kind of don't want to warm up. I think uh-huh. like. You yeah. know, because we, we've been putting so much stock into like Tenet welcoming people back. So like, I don't want to like ruin that. I want that first time I sit back in a theater where I go like, ah, I want it to be Tenet. Okay. And I and just recently watched Jaws and Jurassic Park and I didn't, I just recently watched Empire Strikes Back. So like all the movies they're bringing back, I just kind of watched within the last like month or two. Yeah. So like I'm ready. I, I think I, I think I'm going to wait for Tenet. I'm saving myself for Nolan. Jake and I were having this discussion earlier because we were doing interviews for My Spy and I was like, like Inception's going to hit theaters on the 17th um, along with like a bunch of films like Jaws and uh, all these major films. I think Interstellar is coming back to theaters, which I'm super excited about. Um, and I asked Jake, I'm like, will you go see Inception? And he's like, and I actually agree with him. I'm not going to, I'm going to wait till Tenet 2. I want Tenet to be my first movie oh, to go Kev, back to. That's but then a big Kevin one. also said I'll something wait. else that was shocking to me. Tell me, tell him what you told me. What did I say? Oh, this is the IMAX discussion yeah yeah so we had a discussion this this is actually a question that jake brought up on the show about whether or not i would go see tenant if it wasn't in true imax oh and i i don't know that i would i mean i feel like the only exception i would make is if i had to see it in like limax like in the in the fake imax right where right. it's not the full one four three one ratio that i like to see it with like 70 millimeter imax but i mean to be honest with you i mean the, i think the amcs like the dolbys and the and the imaxes I, I, while I would not prefer to go to one of those over like a, a 70 millimeter projection, sure. I would still go if that was the only format, if it was an IMAX format. I would never yeah, yeah. see the film in non IMAX as long as I can get those aspect ratio shifts. But I have a feeling I, I, I live in D.C. and the Smithsonian has two true IMAXs in Udvar Hazi and Lockheed Martin. Well, Lockheed Martin's where Sean and I did our the Q&A for the Russo yeah. brothers. Um, and uh, that's where I want to see it. But. Be considering the world we're in right now, if I had to go to a, a, a non-true IMAX, I would still go. But if someone sent me a screener right now or told me I could see it on a normal screen, I wouldn't go. I'm envisioning a scenario where we do get Nolan on the show and he asks just in conversation casually to Kevin, like, oh, how did you see it? Like, what format? Where did you go? And Kevin has to tell him, like... <laughs> Oh, I, went I watched to, it on my phone. I went to well, Mazda Gallery. <laughs> I watched it on Theater 9, the small I, one at the end of the hallway. On a digital projector. 
<laughs> I, and, yeah, the, I, and the audio and picture is off by like two seconds <laughs> yeah but honestly to be 100 honest with you this is the, the bottom line i think jake and i were discussing this because jake did ask this question on the show a few weeks a couple weeks ago or maybe even last week when i i was in a particular mood last week so i apologize but um i was probably being a little bit defensive but honestly I, if, if warner brothers sent me a screener of tenant right now i would not watch it I just I'm not going to go down that rabbit hole because of the arguments that stewed from last week. But I do want to point out that we got a lot of comments from people who said that was their favorite part of the show, that they love when we get huh. passionate about conversations because it shows how much we care about stuff. So yeah. I, I want to remove any kind of stigma that uh, arguments don't work <laughs> on this show, because I think it's best when we when we mix it up a little bit. And the, yeah, and the was, audience tends to agree. I was I was texting Gabe. I was I was just in a mood. I was in a mood that week. It was like one of those like you ever get in like one of those like because, you know, and again, I'm not blaming it on my, my time passing, but it was just a lot of things been happening. And I think it was just at that moment. I was like I went into like this super immature defensive mode, like arguing with a brother. You know what I mean? Like when you're younger, my brother and I would like argue about stuff. That's how mm -hmm. that argument felt. Like I felt like See, I knew Kevin, Jake. That's why you should just be like me and be a defensive asshole all the time. <laughs> that yeah. way it just sort of seems like normal and like, well, that's it's just true. how he is. Yeah, we now, just I've, accept that. And I've kind of come around. I still I, I still understand those limitations about the switching of the eligibility. But I also understand what Jake was saying about like the idea of like, well, let the year be the year it is. And that kind of it's interesting. So anyways, it was a fun but, debate. It was Speaking a of the, yeah. the year being the year that it is. Oh, Gabe, I'm sorry. You want to throw something? Bef before we move on, before yes. we move on to our favorite movies of 2020 so far, I wanted to correct that Jacob from Holland said that theaters started opening in June. Yes. And that their best movie they saw this year was Once Upon a Time in the West. Oh, right, right, right. He showed that retro yeah. footage from that. So Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, that's pretty cool. Which was cool. Yeah, anyway, that is continue. Very cool. All right, so we're going to celebrate the three best films that we've seen so far this year and to further prove that we are pretentious film critic jerks uh we are allowed to pick things that we have seen that you guys have not uh to to sort of boost our morale and then talk about how cool we are uh to that end so we're gonna all of us will do number three then all of us will do number two our number twos and then we'll all finish our number ones i'm gonna start by telling you and we're not gonna go into in-depth detail with these because they're movies that we've talked about but i'm gonna mention quiet place too uh, Quiet Place 2 is one of the last films that we saw before everything went into quarantine. I actually did see The Hunt afterwards, so it's not the very last one. It is the last junket that we were able to do together. We were all up in New York City. Um, we have. <laughs> we a still have that John, interview. We yeah, haven't published yet. John Krasinski interview banked. I keep forgetting um, that we have. It's a great interview. I keep forgetting that we have that. It's also so weird. Think about how weird that whole um, day was, because that was where we first started to get into the Hey, don't shake his hand. Yeah. Um, you know, the 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 yeah. tepidness about quarantine. I remember there was how... the weird like, do we do we get a picture? Like, is it going to be weird if we like because like, yeah. my picture with him is like kind of like because normally, you know, I'm a very like, oh, you know, hold on, perk, perk, perk. <laughs> like, like, a, like a squeezing kind of, you know, yeah, yeah, and yeah. I, in my picture, I'm just kind of like leaning in close to him. Yeah, because yeah, you're Same, right. It was like, like the first steps. Yeah, <laughs> it is a great it's a really good interview. And, and one of the reasons why I love that interview is he tells the story about a scene that you should go back and rewatch right now because it's in the trailer, which is the truck coming at Emily Blunt. Oh, and. One of the things that we've had a great conversation with, especially in the um, the one that we just did for the Vast of Night, of how you just put things together um, on the day. And he talks about building that scene and he talks about the stunt coordinators and the safety protocol people on the set assuring him that it was going to be OK. But them still saying, like, are we really going to do this kind of thing? Yeah. Um, yeah, also, I, like, it's also his wife in that it's, it's in that yeah. vehicle, too. And, it's, so and that, kids, that and they're real kids whose kids. families let yeah. them go into that car. And that's a scene you can watch in the trailer. This isn't a big spoiler. Um, I love Quiet Place, too, because it found a way back into that world. It didn't feel like uh, we're just going to move the story along because it, the first one did really well. Uh, it explores really interesting plates. It has a really great performance by Killian Murphy. Uh, and and some really interesting twists and turns uh, of where they go in exploring some of these new characters. So I'm putting that at number three right now. It's down for a September uh, first weekend of September release, providing everything holds. So um, hopefully we will be able to see Quiet Place 2 soon. Kev, what's your number three? All right. My number three. Before I say my number three, Jake, I I feel like I already know your number one because you texted about it. Uh, yeah. I have not seen that one yet, so don't go too plot wise. Oh, fair. Because um, I'm watching it right yeah. after the show. All right. Beautiful. Um, number three is Defy Bloods. Nice. And I think a lot of that has to do with just, I think Spike Lee kind of blended together two of my favorite things about storytelling emotion and technical aspects of filmmaking. 
and he utilized aspects of filmmaking with like aspect ratios and film stock and different types of film to create a world of immersion for the audience. And I also love that Spike Lee trusts his audience. Um, a lot of filmmakers and studios and movies don't really think their audiences are smart sometimes, I find. Mm. And there's a lot of exposition and a lot of over explaining in movies. And a lot of it can be done through visual and different ways. And the idea of having the current actors play their their Vietnam flashbacks in their current ages was something I just found truly incredible. But it did confuse people. People were like, what's going on here? And I feel like that was such an interesting thing because it allowed the audience essentially to collaborate with Spike Lee. You kind of like you kind of became you worked with them. I, I get that. And then the, and then the message about PTSD and how no matter how old you get, when you relive those memories, you're still reliving them in your current body. And that's kind of the concept. And also the de-aging, I think, wouldn't have worked. I still have trouble with the de-aging in Irishman personally. But I think that the Five Bloods is just it's outstanding filmmaking. Delroy Lindo is amazing. I don't find the film to be perfect. There are faults to it. I feel like, you know, there are storylines that don't necessarily play out as much as I wanted them to. It feels a little uneven at times. But that unevenness kind of like kept me on edge. It kind of kept me like it, I was in it the whole time. Like it always kept me on my toes. And so that's why I thought that film was so interesting. You know why? Because it was so unique. I never yeah. seen a movie like that before ever. I mean, that guy takes risks. I mean, you watch Do the Right Thing, 25th Hour. That guy is operating in a very different headspace as a filmmaker. And I like that he allows his audience to be a collaborator with him and be smart with them and and go on that journey. So that's why it's my number three. I've had two people tell me they had to turn that movie off halfway through because emotionally it was too much. It was yeah, too much for them. Interesting. Two different people wow. have told me that. And I asked them the scene and they were um, two different scenes that they bailed out on where they just said, I can't. It's too. But I, but what I admire about Spike is that he's just going to make his he's going to make the movie. It's unapologetic. Yeah. And if it's really timely yeah. and if it's if it's commenting on things that make you uncomfortable, that's almost the point. That's almost the point. So, uh, yeah. Jakey, number three. My number three is The Best of Night. Um, I love the, the simplicity of it. Um, yeah. You know, it's it's. A story that we've seen a thousand times before, but also not ever seen from a perspective unlike anything we've ever seen. There are so many different layers to it, you know, uh, that I like. I, I think I'm very excited about this director and sort of seeing what he is able to do next. Um, I promise, like whenever his name pops up on whatever next movie he told us that he's working on, um, I'm going to be very intrigued. There are a lot of technical aspects that made me go like, oh, that's that's interesting. Um, and then also I loved a lot of like the low key themes, this idea of listening to voices that you've never listened to before. And it's easy on the surface to, um, and we talked to him about this, you know, it's easy on the surface to say like that we're specifically talking about aliens, but more so that like the two prominent people who had something to say in the film were a black man and an elderly woman, Mm -hmm. uh, in the 1950s in the South. Um, and I just really thought that that was such a, a fantastic perspective to put in there. Uh, loved the performances from the two leads. Um, for me, a huge, huge, huge X factor in terms of my favorite movies of the year um, is how much I'm thinking about them after it's done. There are a lot of movies this year that I saw instantly was like, oh, my God, that was great. And then within a week, so it was like, yeah, I'm not really not really thinking much about this. This was mm-hmm. a slow burn for me. Like I really when it was over, I really dug it. I was like, oh, I really enjoyed that. But I think I'm like almost a month out from having seen it. And I still think about it at least once a day. Um, so really, really dug Vast of Night. I was very excited to have um, the director on, on our podcast. And uh, so, yeah, that's my number three. My number two um, is a movie that's coming out this Friday. It's called Irresistible. Uh, I love this movie. And I it, it, it blew me away how much I enjoyed it because I went into it thinking it's going to be heavy handed uh, political commentary. And I was just reminded of how smart John Stewart is uh, when he's tackling politics and analyzing the media. And I thought it was really uh, it pulls no punches and goes after both sides. It goes after the media and how they're enabling so much of this. And I enjoyed it the first time through because Steve Carell is fantastic playing the type of role that Steve Carell is the best at, which is somebody who is really a jerk under the surface, but you still kind of like him for some reason. It's a little bit of Michael Scott. I didn't watch any of Space Force, but I think he kind of plays that role in Space Force. Um, But he's a Democratic strategist, political strategist, uh, who is following up the Hillary Clinton loss in 2016. Like it takes place in our world and it's the Democrats trying to come to terms with how on earth did we blow this? 
So they're trying to find their way forward, and he zeroes in on a candidate uh, played by Chris Cooper in a tiny mayoral race in Wisconsin. And uh, Carell's like, if I can groom this guy, I'll kind of get my mojo back. And then, of course, it balloons into a much bigger political race. But it's it's told through the lens of John Stewart, who wrote the screenplay and directed it. Uh, it has a, a few twists and turns I did not see coming. And I was able to go back and see it a second time. And it's one of those movies where it's a completely different movie the second time through. Um, it's smarter. It's funnier. And like Jake said, it's one of those movies that I just have thought about nonstop since I watched it. And uh, I was really, really impressed with it. I'm a huge John Stewart fan. I loved what he did on The Daily Show. I hate that the machine of The Daily Show burned him out. I think he just got really fed up with the uh, like the the endless BS that comes with that beat. <laughs> Um, obviously the, the redundancy and the lies and everything that comes with politics uh, and the media, uh, in our world nowadays. And so he just like, was like, F it, I'm going to go live on a farm in New Jersey and God bless him. But I'm glad that he came back with this story because I thought it was, uh, it's really, really well done for this time. And I think people need to check it out on VOD. We were going to review it in a little bit, but I just did. So I, there you I go. have a question for you. So I have seen so many negative reviews of that movie, I would oh, say no almost kidding. like, yeah, I would say almost universally negative. So I was curious really? you, why you think, um, uh, I, okay, well, I, didn't, I, I didn't know you didn't know that. I just, That's um, fascinating. I just no, but I wanted I was, to, I know the embargo broke recently and um, Eric Eisenberg is doing the review for Cinema Blend and he only gave it three stars out of five. I would, I gave it four and a half, uh, but I didn't do the review for the site, but I was curious how it was going to play with people. I'm going to go back and read about all the reviews now because I'm curious what people's takeaway is. From a Kev, you saw it. Did you like it as much as I did or are you kind of lukewarm? I was lukewarm on it. That's personally. interesting. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it's so funny because I love Jon Stewart. I actually thought Rosewater was very good. I thought mm -hmm. Rosewater was a fantastic film. Um, but again, I have only saw that movie once and I liked it when I saw it. I had to revisit it to, to know if I still like it. But yeah. um, one thing I do like about what he does in this film is he brought back a very old school. This is super nerdy, but he brought back a very old school aspect ratio. Did you notice when you watched it, there were black bars in the left and right side of the screen? No, I didn't even notice. It's it's literally like a, a old school ratio called one six six. It was it was the same ratio this movie called The Great McGinty was shot in. Mm -hmm. um, so he was using that ratio along with themes from Mr. Smith Goes to Washington to kind of and those aspects and that, and that type of storytelling and those types of ideas. I thought were interesting as from a filmmaking perspective, I found the characters just to be a little, I just didn't find them memorable. Okay. Um, and I think the concept is funny. I mean, there's a great, there, there's a really random scene, which is actually in the trailer where Rose Byrne licks Steve Carell's face, um, which I don't know if, did you, if you asked them about this, Sean, but that was her first day on set. Yeah. And it was the first yeah. time she ever met Steve Carell. <laughs> so like, she's like, uh, there's a this scene, Jake, where she literally just licks his face. And it's yeah. like, it, and I found that it, it was funny, but it, like it took me out of the film for a second. I, I just found the comedy didn't blend so well, I thought, with the politics in the sense mm. of I think Stewart's a, one of the smartest people on the planet. Um, I just didn't find the storytelling to be as engaging as I wanted it to be. I think performance wise, like there's a great bit where like they're both on TV together at one point and like Carell walks over to her shot. And there's like some funny stuff in there that really yeah. kind of plays into the media aspect of it. Um I won't go into more detail. I thought the ending was a little strange. Interesting. Um, okay. But yeah, I won't, I won't, I won't go into detail. But I would. I think a three is probably a fair rating for it. I didn't love it. I didn't hate it. I thought it was just fine. Jake, I want you to check it out and break the tie. Okay. I would love to hear what your take on it. There's a very funny bit where Carell's character is is always doing something really raunchy. Like he's he's constantly in a battle with Rose Byrne's character, and he'll he'll make really sexual like overtones about like how they're trying to get up on each other like power. And every time he does it, an old woman from the town walks in front of him, and she always just happens to be there. Her name is Dot, and Corella yeah. has to go. I, I, oh, I'm so, I'm sorry, Dot. I'm so sorry. Like you shouldn't you shouldn't have seen that kind of thing. And it just keeps escalating. That's funny. Yeah, it's multiple times. That right? part was funny. There yeah. there's some great there's some really good stuff in there. Um, some funny stuff. I just I also I think a lot of it. And again, this is maybe just my ignorance in regards to politics. I mean, I, I mean, I know I I feel like I know general politics, right? Mm. But this stuff, this movie goes really deep into some things that I wasn't fully fully aware of. So I felt like personally, some stuff went over my head. And so I think I guess well, I'm, not, I'm not trying to sound like I'm stupid, but I guess my point would be if you if you watch this film and you're not a big political person, 
some of this stuff might fly over your my, over your head a little bit. I thought. I'm excited to read the reviews now because yeah. I wasn't I wasn't sure I was going to play, and I I really really liked it, so I'm curious how it plays. All right, Why Kat, is it called Irresistible? I I honestly think, and I wanted to ask him this in the thing. I think it's just because the word resist is in the middle. Right. Well, I mean, there's one point in the film where they do show like the title and then they they read out resist. Yeah. But why call it irresistible? Well, I think you're looking for a candidate who would be irresistible on the national stage. Mm-hmm. Right. You're looking for someone who plays to yeah. both sides. Um, you're talking about how they put on a facade to almost make themselves look irresistible to people. I mean, it's all about image in a campaign. Right. And they, they talk a lot. About, there's a there's a point where the townsfolk are upset because they back Chris Cooper's uh, character and Steve Carell comes in and is pouring all this money into his campaign. And then the mayor, uh, the, the incumbent who he's running against, retaliates with an ad and sets up a campaign office in town. And the town who's working for Chris Cooper gets very discouraged. And yeah. Steve Carell says, wait a second, you mean to tell me that the incumbent ran a political ad and he <laughs> set up a campaign office like and the way he says it to them is just like well of course you it, like this is how it's done sort of thing yeah but they're so new to it they've never seen any of this and i think it's him telling them like it's all about image it's all about what we put forward and it's never about the strength of the candidate which i think is really scary and terrifying as we approach uh, a national election sean did you feel i didn't feel like john stewart's voice came through the movie <laughs> Um, see, but I, I think it did, if only because and, and especially on the rewatch, there's a lot of stuff that the second like when it starts, it starts with Rose Byrne and Steve Carell essentially talking to the media and saying they have these both of them have these amazing speeches that are cut back and forth where they say to the news media, hey, we're lying to you. You know that we're lying to you. Everything that we're saying to you right now is not true. And you're not going to call us on it, you know? And then and they go back and forth with this for a little while. And then at the end, they say, OK, I'll see you at the bar, you know, in five minutes, hmm. which goes to show that the politicians and the news media are yeah. all in the same bed. And I, I think so much of that, like then when they talk about the um, and this is getting really into this movie and you guys just just watch it. But there's a shot where they announce the um, the uh, results of the 2016 election and they just cut to an image that I only know as the cover of a Van Halen album, which is a fat guy standing in front of a cannon and he's getting a cannonball right to the gut. Right. And I don't know why Van Halen chose that as the cover of their Van Halen three album. It's the one that has Gary Sharon from Extreme as their singer. Um, but that was John Stewart saying that's what it felt like. It felt like you got a cannonball to the gut when everybody sort of believed that Hillary was going to win the election and then and then Trump ends up winning. So and, that, I, and what Sh- what Sean is saying, which is important just to give some context, is basically like, as he said, like this is this is rooted in reality. So like Rose mm-hmm. Burns character worked on the Trump campaign yeah. and Steve Carell worked on the uh, the Clinton campaign. And so what's interesting about the film, what I found interesting, though, is that he wanted to groom essentially a conservative type of person chris mm-hmm. cooper's character i think that's what they were going for into yeah, yeah. more into more of a democratic candidate to win yes. over the conservative votes to win that so that it's a cool concept it actually makes sense i just i just so all of those insights i found that to be john stewarty you know interesting like that <laughs> take on that world i found yeah. to be his voice kind of thing yeah. so um <laughs> kev you're number two my number two is bad boys three uh <laughs> and i was just like and the reason I went with it is because I I love that franchise and it and it delivered it delivered for me. I loved yep. Bad Boys Three and I rewatched it the other day. Um, and that film, by the way, takes so many risks. Um, I have to tell you when they shoot Mike, uh, you know Mike Lowry in that sequence on the motorcycle, mm-hmm. that was a that was a genuinely like gasping moment as a fan. And we're like, you know, 20, 30 minutes into the movie. He's been shot visibly three times in his chest. Like he's going to die, it looks like. Um, And like there was a part of me where I was like, I don't want Mike to be gone. Like I I just love this franchise. And I feel like these filmmakers who stepped in really, really made their own movie, but still kept Bay's style. But they still Mm -hmm. made their own movie. They didn't copy Michael Bay. I mean, they let Michael Bay direct his own scene. If you missed our interview with uh, the directors, (laughs) such a great scene to them. Yeah, and Michael Bay directs his own like circle shot. It's cool. But in general, I thought Bad Boys 3 was it was a pretty risky film. It's actually super. I was in more and I were discussing this the other day. It's one of the most violent movies I've ever seen. And I, it's, it's genuinely violent. And I don't, I'm not I'm not using that as a way to say it's good. But that movie is 
hardcore. Um, and like Paneliano's character dying off, like that was a gigantic loss. Like for me as a fan of the franchise. So I just feel like the weight of that film, um, it could have been a cash grab. And I feel like everybody brought their A game. Like Will Smith became Mike Lowry again. And we've all interviewed Will Smith. Will Smith is nothing like Mike Lowry in real life. Nothing like him whatsoever. Um, and I find it interesting that he embodies Mike so interestingly. Um, but for me, Bad Boys 3, as a fan of those films and Bad Boys 2 being one of my favorite action movies of all time, that movie delivered and I loved it. I've seen it multiple times. It's not perfect, but as a fan, it's my number two of the year. That's awesome. Jakey? That's cool. Uh, my number two is The Lodge. Oh, um, really? I love that movie. I love how much I was surprised by it. I can't tell you how many times like, at, you know, I'd hit a beat and just go, what in the hell is going on? Um, I love that the ending is not what I expected in the best way possible. I thought it was there were some killer performances, um, but I was just so unsettled the entire time. And it's such a great example of like cinematic misdirection where it throws some facts at you and some things about certain characters at you at the beginning to just almost like in such a subtle way, but like to almost trick you into thinking that you have it figured out. And mm-hmm. because you'll think like, Oh, I remember I was told that mm-hmm. and I guarantee that's going to come back into play at the end. And it just doesn't do what it sets you up to make you think it's going to do without I feel like it doesn't make sense if you haven't seen the movie. I'm trying not to give it away. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. But I just thought like it was just so unnerving. And like the when it ended, it just left me going like, oh, like I like I just need like not a gross, but I just, I just need to like shake it off. Like, yeah, yeah. Oh, ah, ah. Um, so I, I mean, we talk about like like, you know, everlasting effects on movies. I just thought it was absolutely incredible. So that's on Hulu right now, right? Yes. Yes. Uh, Bad Boys for Life and Irresistible are both uh, paid VOD and The Five Bloods is on Netflix. I just want to let everybody know this is great. And The Vast of Night is on Amazon. Vast of Night is on Amazon. You can go and watch all these right now. That's fantastic that we're, you know, in a weird sort of way, (laughs) these movies are readily available. Uh, My number one so far is uh, The Five Bloods for most of the reasons that Kevin said. Uh, I just think it's but but here's what I find really interesting. I gave The Five Bloods five stars. And I, I honestly do think it's one of Str- Spike's strongest films, but I don't know when we get to the end of the year if it's going to be my number one, right? Because I agree with Kevin, it has some flaws, but it was so emotionally gut punching. But when we do a top 10, I think we sort of build favorite. And I had this problem last year with Endgame and Irishman. I respected Irishman and was so blown away by what it accomplished um, and I put it as my number one. But if you asked me now, do I like Endgame more than Irishman? I probably like Endgame more than Irishman. And that's going to play in the back of my mind when I start to put together a list at the end of the year. The Five Bloods blew me away and I was so moved by everything that Spike did. But do I love it? You know, is it a movie that I'm going to throw on multiple times as we talk about warm blanket blend? You know, it's not that kind of movie. It's confrontational. It gets in your face. It raises really uncomfortable conversations. I think they're really important to have, and I'm glad that he's doing it, but I wonder how I'll feel at the end of the year. But for right now, currently, uh, it is the best film that I've seen. And and honestly, if you have Netflix, you should be checking it out. So that's my number one. Kev. My number one, I feel like Invisible Man uh, is the best thing I've seen this year so far. Um, Just just from a filmmaking perspective, I just really respect Lee Whannell. Um, He's like one of us. He was like a reviewer, you know, like he loves movies and, you know, broke out with a Saw franchise with James Wan. Um, I just feel like Upgrade is such a, an incredible action film and, the, and then to deliver the Upgrade style into an Invisible Man film that also spoke to domestic violence and also spoke to so many important themes. But also what made Invisible Man so scary was that it wasn't so far from reality. Um, like the science of what you would have to do to create an Invisible Man with like reflections of cameras and lenses and, you know, that while it is extreme and probably would never work the way it does in the film, we're not far off from that technology being something we could play with. And I think that at the end of the day, to have someone in your house that you can't see in a, but in a non sci-fi way, you know, he's not liquid metal. It's, it, you know, it, it feels grounded. Um, it makes it that much more terrifying. And I still, think that kitchen scene is a work of art i mean the way they film that choreograph that sequence that wonder with elizabeth moss being thrown around the kitchen 
uh, is just incredible filmmaking. Um, and I'll never forget, I, I interviewed Aldous Hodge recently for the Blu-ray release. There's a scene in that film where Aldous Hodge is on the ground getting beaten up by the Invisible Man. And he had he basically did all that himself, physically, like lifted himself in the air, threw himself back. Oh, took, my God. Like, you know, like, I mean, like he said, it was all core work. He was like he was like lifting himself like up, like and like flying back. I was like, dude, wow. I, I could not believe that they did it like that. And I remember I'll, I'll never forget the trailer when she pours the paint. I'm like, yeah. why did they ruin that? But that scene still plays. It so still hard plays, man. In it the still movie. plays. It's terrifying. I yeah. still think. One of the greatest crowd reaction. We should do crowd reaction blend one day. That'd be a fun one. That's a good one. Because one of my favorite crowd reactions ever was the, that restaurant scene when her yeah. sister when her sister gets killed. Oh my god, that's a and great one. Like, like people just oh jumped, like freaked yes. out. Like yeah, I yeah. hadn't seen people get that like crazy in a movie theater. And this is a random one I've mentioned that's it a before. Huge one. But Breaking Dawn Part Two was one of my favorite theater experiences ever. Twilight, yeah, because they did this twist in the film where people didn't know their favorite characters were not actually dead, and I just <laughs> love listening to people in the audience like like getting angry or upset. And so we should do crowd reaction blend. That'd oh, be fun. and, and also throw back to an old interview. Please listen to Jake talking to Bill Condon about that scene because <laughs> we have an interview with oh, Bill yeah. Condon, and That's Jake got into that conversation with him. Twists. Ever in oh, the hands, like great. The, it was so satisfying. Jake, it's <laughs> I will great. Never forget it's it. Great. I, I, I hate those movies so Dude, much. So great. It I, was I an awesome it. twist. No crowd yeah. reaction will ever beat though. Cap catching it and saying, "Assemble." That's it. That's that's Let me the ask whole. You this. There's no so crowd reaction. So funny. I I prefer the Thor. dead silent like opening night because I'd already seen it, so I knew what was coming. Yeah. But I went back opening night of Infinity War. And the dead silence as a three, four hundred packed theater walked out after like, you know, when when Cap says, oh, my God, when you realize what's happened and it cuts to black and you realize like I've never seen the silence that people walked out and like, like like there was just like a what the like to me, that is more powerful than. People screaming like, oh, that's a really cool moment. Like to me, when you can make 400 mm-hmm. people shut the hell up, yeah. that's that, that's awesome. What's it like Sean, being wrong? Sean, what? I'd argue, I'd argue <laughs> that the moment when Thor <laughs> enters Wakanda is more, oh, is, is more powerful from an audience perspective. I mean, Avengers Assemble was a big deal, but I think the Thor entrance into Wakanda made me the most excited. You're asking me to choose between uh, PJ your or kids. Brendan, and I can't yeah. do it. I can't. I can't. It's impossible. Actually, I think on your left was is even stronger than Assemble. But I will yeah. never. Here's the thing. I sat next to Adam Frazier, a very close friend of mine, uh, in Atlanta, where we had to drive down to Atlanta to see Endgame. And I will never forget that in the moment between when Chris uh, Chris Evans says Avengers. And then Adam sat next to me and he said, he's going to say it. And then he said, <laughs> assemble. And then and our theater screamed. And I will always hear Adam's voice in between those two. <laughs> Adam goes, and he wasn't talking to me. He was just talking out loud. And he just said, he's going to say it. And then he said it. And it was because remember Whedon <laughs> cut him off at the end of Age of Ultron. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. the gag has been he's never been able to say it up to this point. And he finally got yeah. to say it. It was great. That's awesome. Uh, where are we? Number one? Jake, Me. number one. Yeah. My number one uh, is a movie that's not out yet, but it's a little movie called Palm Springs. Nice. Uh, I was texting you guys as I progressively fell more and more and more and more and more in love. Like, remember, I don't know if you guys remember, like I was watching <laughs> it on a Friday night and at first it was like, guys, I'm watching this movie and like, I'm really digging it. And then yeah. I, then I said, and here's the deal. I want to express how much I love this movie without saying anything. Yeah, you can. If you can. If it's possible, because this is I was fortunate enough to I have know this happen nothing to me. about yes, it. Yes, that's that's perfect. Watch it without knowing what it's about. Um, the trailer ruins the bit. Um, unfortunately, I feel I like it. Kevin, without giving too much away, I feel like at the junket on Thursday, like when we talk to the cast, we're gonna have to talk about what it's about. Like you can't not, like otherwise, there's not really much to talk about. Yeah. Um, and so I feel bad that I'm like going to ha- eventually have to ruin it for people. Well, here's the but thing. It, I'll say this. Knowledge I don't know what it's about, so bit, be careful. Yeah, no, no. Knowledge of the bit doesn't ruin the movie. No, um, you're right. But like that, that there's, there's whenever you, but whenever you watch it and, and Sean, you know what I'm talking about. Mm-hmm. There's maybe a 60 second moment mm-hmm. where you sort of go, 
wait, what the hell is this movie about? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. it takes you in one direction, and then there's 60 seconds where you go, wait, what? Mm-hmm. And then from that point on, you know I what it's no about. Idea. Like you, you get the bit. I, but I for that like for like the I like the joy of that 60 seconds where I just didn't know what it was about right. was such a unique thrill that I haven't felt in a long time just because we so often we get advanced knowledge about things and we watch trailers like I very I haven't allowed myself to be surprised by a movie but beyond that I just thought it was so clever I thought the screenplay was so smart I laughed out loud from start to finish I thought like I'm like hot and cold on Andy Samberg. There are sometimes I think he's hilarious. Like I think he's hilarious in pop star. And there's some moments where I'm like, eh, I don't know, but I thought he was fantastic. I thought, I thought the, um, the chemistry between him and uh, Christina, uh, was absolutely so great. incredible. So great. Uh, I thought JK Simmons was fantastic. Um, it was, it's the first, it was only, it was only about 90 minutes. If I remember right. Yeah. It's the first movie in a long time where the, and I didn't, but the second it was over, there was a moment where I thought like, I might watch it again. Yeah, yeah. Like, I legit thought, like, I con- genuinely considered just starting it over from the top. I absolutely loved it. I've watched it since because I watched it with uh, with Amanda. I love this movie. It, it, uh, you know, we talk about you know warm blankets. Like th- this was almost a warm blanket for me. A movie for me. Like I feel like later, like there's gonna be moments where I like replay it this year and it starts streaming on uh, Hulu in a couple of weeks. Cool. For our That's audience, awesome. Sean, what, give the basic story about how this was purchased at Sundance because it was like the most expensive purchase ever, right? I think it was, didn't it, yeah, didn't it beat it, the birth like of the 17, nation? I think it's 17.5 yeah. million. It's not like, it's not a huge sale. Um, but still at Sundance, that's, that's a pretty big title for it. Uh, that's, a pretty it big that's the record, right? Isn't purchase. that the, that's the, isn't that the record for Sundance? It was, yeah, but they've all kind of, uh, that is, that record has changed like the last four years because it's just, it's a, it's an escalating game kind of thing, but yeah. it's, uh, and I'm not sure if it won the audience prize there or not, but you could totally see why it's focus. No, no uh, is it focus features that's bringing it to Hulu? I forget who's behind it. Focus was behind oh, no. irresistible. So maybe it's not them. No, it's not. Um, but then the problem is, you know, they, they bought these films at those early film festivals, Sundance all being the only one that was able to go. And then the theatrical window completely got decimated because I think this movie could have done well. Um, but the fact I, I love it's going to Hulu because people don't have to wait for it then. And the search continues to find out who that is in pop star. What you what you didn't ask Capital? I, I, I was, I'm, I'm thinking about asking Andy Sandberg tomorrow, but I wasn't sure. I feel like he's going to be like. Oh, we're not it's telling you kind of thing. It's really like a wasted question. It has to be. He, he can be a tough. It, maybe I'm the only one that feels this way. I feel like Andy Samberg is actually kind of a tough interview. I've he never had be, him before. Like it's a lot of comedians can be hot and cold. Um, yeah. And I feel like I'm such a massive pop star fan. Like Lauren and I went front row to see Lonely Island perform the pop star songs uh, in Brooklyn last year. So it's like it's a big deal for me. And I'm like still nervous about talking to him. But in a weird way, I, I, God, I would love to know if it's Apatow. For people who don't know what we're referring to, there's a scene in pop star where somebody's private parts are <laughs> being Placed. signed. Yeah, in a limo, and there's <laughs> rumors that apparently it's Judd Apatow, but I just yes. don't, I, I don't buy that. There's no the, way it's Judd Apatow. There's no way. It, yes, it's Dave. on screen for so long. <laughs> yes. It's to answer, to answer your question. Oh. It's Neon is the company. Oh, I thought Neon you were going to answer the other question. No, I don't. Know. <laughs> <laughs> that's why I thought you were jumping. Yes. <laughs> I thought oh, no, you no. knew. I don't care if it's neon. I want to know. Yeah, I got who's private. Pass that game. I don't know whose private when, when, set is. Stick into the window. When you guys, when you guys came to visit for the Real Blend DC show, and like my mom, my dad, Jake, and uh, and Gabe, and Lauren, and I all watched that scene uh, at Pop Star together, and I have probably seen that movie fifteen times. I was crying we were all crying like it's just so funny it's like my favorite I, it's so it's a good scene please see the movie too because i wasn't invited to the <laughs> you were, it was a good time it was a good you time. were with your other boys i was with my other boys that day all right let's get to this week in movies um so we talked about irresistible that's coming to vod on june 26th uh the other movie coming to netflix is eurovision song contest the story of fire and oh the story of fire saga that's right that's the band's name fire saga am i the only one here who's seen it you guys didn't watch it I haven't all right seen it. so i watched half of it um and michelle and i bailed out <laughs> and we were like eh, we got the gist um we, i wasn't doing the junket i'm not gonna review it here but i'll just tell you for the first half of it 
it, it's not funny. It's just not funny. Um, you know, and I here's what happens with Will Ferrell. When he nails a character, when he zeroes in on a character and it works, it works. And then there's a bunch of times where he zeroes in on a character and it doesn't work. And this is just one of the ones that didn't work. Um, this almost feels like to to use an uh, an example that Kevin uses often, like it would have been a really funny three minute SNL sketch. Probably. Yeah. And they just took the idea and made a, I'm assuming, two hour movie out of it. Because that, yeah. that whole world of Eurovision, I know a little bit about it. Like it's a very, I don't want to say strange, but because it means what a lot to a lot of people. Eurovision? It's a very, it's a huge, it's, it's imagine it's, it's almost like American Idol, but through, but every country in Europe gets representation and okay. usually, and it's a, like a mass, like, like millions upon millions of people tune in, not just from Europe, but like around the world. And the concert, like, like everyone gets to like put on a performance and the performance are performances are just insane. Like, like they, 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 it's they a little mass get, singer. They it's can a little get, mass. yeah, they can get wild. It's, it's something it's worth looking at. And, and like, I, there, it's, it's a bummer to hear that it's not funny because within that world should be a really funny comedy. And I haven't right. seen the film. I just saw the trailer, but like the trailer did nothing for me. Like I didn't laugh or chuckle or smile once during nope. the trailer. And it's, it's, it's How are every, the reviews? I'm not sure if they've even dropped yet. I don't know, maybe I can't even talk about it. Who knows? <laughs> um, no, I, we're only talking I, about I, half no, of it I to think, be fair. I think the embargo is like, I saw, I saw people tweeting about it today. It is it is every predictable plot point that you would assume that they would work into a screenplay about this. His father doesn't like the his father played by Pierce Brosnan doesn't like the fact that he's a singer. Um, Rachel McAdams has a crush on Will Ferrell, um, even though they they have like a brother sister vibe to them, but they're not brother sister. But everybody in that town is so it's such a small town that they all assume they're related. Um, and of course. They are terrible, but they get themselves into Eurovision in, in literally the laziest way possible. The selection committee, this happens in the first few minutes. The selection committee has um, a singer who is such a shoe in um, f- to win, played by Demi Lovato. Like she has the look, she's the voice, she's going to win. Um, but they say the rules say we have to have um, 12 groups uh, to submit, but we only have 11. So uh, who are we going to pick? And someone literally holds up a box and someone dips their hand in and pulls it out. And it's Will Ferrell and, and Rachel McAdams. And I was like, well, if you're not even going to try a movie, then why should I even try? Like, <laughs> meet me halfway. Give me something to somewhat care about. But it just went down the laundry list of like, here are all the lazy things that we can put into our screenplay. And so we bailed after halfway through. And then the next night I said to Michelle, I said, uh, do we want to go back to Eurovision and finish it? And she was like. I, I think we got it. I think we got it. So um, I think we got the we gist. Did, we did not finish. And listen, this goes against everything internally that I feel about. I, I would watch anything Rachel McAdams is in, unfortunately, but not, but not this. This was embarrassing. And it's I, what I hate about it is a guy who did Wedding Crashers. Uh, David Dobkin is that his name, the director? Yeah. And I think Wedding Crashers sure. is really smart and funny. I think yeah. I think that's a, a very good comedy. That makes great use of Vince Vaughn and Owen Wilson. And again, Rachel McAdams uh, is really was good. Was Rachel that McAdams film, so. married to someone that time travels in this? Because that seems to be her niche. Uh, well, I mean, I didn't see the back half of the movie. That would be a really interesting twist for for Eurovision. She just, she just keeps making the movies where she's married to time. Saga. She doesn't get to time travel, but she's married to people that time she travel. She does do that quite often, yes. No, there was no, in the bits that I watched... There's there no time, time travel here. Well, yeah, significantly so. less interested then. All right, let's get to uh, this week's blend game, which has gotten a ton of really great reaction on social media. Gabe came up with the concept of hashtag great warm idea. blanket blend. And this is a film that you just, when you want to feel good, when you need to improve your mood, you put this movie on because it's one of your favorites of all time. And it picks you up. Uh, it's one of those ones we talk about too, where if you're, channel surfing and it's on one of the cable channels you tend not to to keep going you stay where you're at with it uh so i picked three did you guys pick three no pick one you picked one what kevin the hell did, you, what, the, what the hell did you pick three for i kevin texted and he said he picked his three picks to gabe did, were we were talking, talking about, about like the top three oh, of the year oh when you said that in the text chain i thought we were doing <laughs> <laughs> and then we were doing three. So I think no, right, I so I'll go I'll go last then. I'll go last and I'll I'll reduce it down to one. Jake, go first. Uh my warm <laughs> blanket movie is Jurassic Park. Oh, of course um, it is. I mean when like I always tell people like I was the perfect age for that movie, but like I like you are every kid at five, six years old is obsessed with dinosaurs. 
Um, so to have that movie come out, and I loved like kind of Every scary kid? stuff as a kid. I, I, I think so. I think a lot of kids are obsessed with dinosaurs. went through a dinosaur phase. I like girls. No, no. <laughs> Can you not like both? I like girl dinosaurs. <laughs> Two out of three of the hosts uh, of the show are married, and one's not. So maybe that, maybe that's why. Maybe it's because I chose dinosaurs. Um, but I'll never forget. Like I was obsessed with that movie. I I, I remember seeing it in theaters, and it was just. A, and I like I was a kid that like liked scary stuff. Um, probably at an age where I like I, my parents took me to see that when I was five, um, which is a pretty intense movie for a five year old. But I'll never forget. I mean, do you guys ever remember like the because now it's so funny because these days like we get and get to see movies months, months, weeks before they come out. We get sent movies weeks before they come out. But when I was a kid, the idea of stumbling across a movie on VHS before it was supposed to come out, it was like finding gold like oh my god like this movie's not out for like a week and we found it mom we have to buy it it's not even out yet and i'll never forget the how day did you, wait what do you mean how did you find a movie on vhs so before my, it so out? my grandma went to like went grocery shopping one day yeah and i guess that store got their shipment of the vh like the jurassic park vhs tapes mm-hmm. and i guess like they weren't supposed to put them out for sale until the next week okay but they like either by accident or or on purpose put them all out for sale that time at that moment. And people were like snatching them up and okay. I'll never forget. And apparently and I'll never forget the image of like me living in my small little house in Buna, Texas and my grandma calling and saying, come outside. I have a surprise for you. Okay. And I walked outside and pouring rain and her running up and saying, uh, because I knew exactly when it was coming out. Like I, like I knew. And she was like, I got this for you. And I was like, grandma, this, this doesn't come out for a week. And she Aww. was like, I know, but food city had it. And, and they, and they, I bought food them all. City. Food, food city. Food city. <laughs> it was called food city. They put them out early and I'll never forget that. And I must've watched that on a freaking loop. And, and I literally like rewatched it a week ago. I watch it probably once every six months. Right. If it's on, if it's on cable, I press play to see where it's at. Um, there's really no moment it could be at that it would make me go, all right, I'm going to, all right, fine. I'll start here. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's, it just makes me feel good. It reminds me of my childhood. It reminds me of that moment with my grandma, um, a moment that like, I tell her that story. She's like, that didn't happen. I'm like, no, it happened. I know it happened. Yeah, yeah. Um, but it just, it makes me feel good. It, it, it makes me, it's, it was one of the movies that made me fall in love with movies because it made me look at like, wait, what is it? Like, I like that, that music they play. Like, that's interesting. And like stuff like that. So, um, yeah, so it had a big impact, and, and, and I love it so. Is a great one, Kevin. What is your uh, warm blanket blend? Mine's mine's kind of random. Um, uh, so mine is strange because I just revisited it like a week ago with Lauren, and every time it's on, we we end up watching the entire movie. Um, and I, I think as I get older, and then the job that I'm in now, watching the film is actually of a different experience than when I saw it when it first came out because I wasn't in the job I'm in. Um, and my pick is Notting Hill. Um, I nice. just, I hey. love that movie so much. It's because a great it, movie. Well, it's about the industry. With a great um, junket scene. Yeah, yeah there's, a, there's, there's a horse and hound junket scene. Um, <laughs> but I always found it like... Uh, I remember, didn't I, I, when I interviewed Julia Roberts once, I slated like that. I was like, I'm Kevin McCarthy from Horse and Hound. And she started like dying laughing. <laughs> Did you, she, she knew? She knew what you were doing? No, no, she knew exactly what I was doing. She That's started like hilarious. dying laughing. That's funny. Um, That's hilarious. But, uh, because normally for people, we, we slate, like we say our name and then the show we're on. And I said Horse and Hound. And I was like, I was like, she's probably heard this a million times. Um, but no, Notting Hill is amazing because I always thought it was an interesting concept to have a... Uh, a person who's not famous dating somebody who's extremely famous. And I love that that interesting element of what their lives bring to each other, um, what she's missing from her life that he has. And it's almost like it's interesting because she has everything right. She's tons of money. She's a big star. And then she sees this guy, you know, who's working in a bookstore and like she wants that lifestyle. She longs for that normalcy. Um, mm-hmm. And I always just found their relationship to be so incredibly beautiful. And then was it Risa Fon, who is the roommate? Um, He's who so is, good. He's so is great. So funny. There's a moment where uh, Julie Roberts is taking a bath and he walks in and then he walks out and he re walks back in to double check to make sure it was her. And I think it's interesting because like Julia Roberts then did this kind of again in Ocean's 12 where she played like. Not the same thing, but it was like a version, uh, like playing around. I think that joke is so funny. I think that's such a funny bit. I love that bit. I agree with you. I think that is such a great moment. Yeah, people shit on that all the time. I think it's great. 
I, I think it's one of the most clever things. But going back to like Notting Hill, I just I, I mean, the, there's a line in that film. I'm just a you know girl standing in front of a boy. I did that. I did. A, I, I reversed that line when I proposed to Lauren. So I said, I'm just a girl, a boy in front of a girl <laughs> asking. Yeah, because uh, the real line is I'm just a girl standing in front of a boy asking you to love me or uh, essentially. And I did it from the reverse. Wait, so that, you pulled Notting Hill into your Nightmare Before Christmas proposal. Notting Hill, Jerry Maguire. Uh, there was a few. I have to go go back. For and people who don't know. Terminator, Terminator 2, like at the end of the proposal, he just went. <laughs> yeah, well, the, 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 no, the, the one the, I used from Terminator smile. Two, the one I used from Terminator Two was, uh, uh, you can't kill people. Why? What was that line when you guys you can't? You oh, you should shooting. have said, Lauren, come with me if you want to love. That's see, wh- see, why didn't I reach out to you prior? Like, that's a great pun. Dick. See, nice job. you redeemed there we yourself. Go. <laughs> um, no, but, but Notting Hill is uh, just a movie that makes me feel good. Like Lauren and I were watching it the other day and it came on TV and we it's just started and we had seen this movie 10, 15 times and we just watched the whole thing. It, it just makes us feel good. It's a it's a really, really beautiful story. And it's just a nice warm blanket literally is how that feels oh, when I put that movie awesome. on. Awesome. You're, you're making me want to go rewatch it. Yeah, I'm it's amazing. I like playing the blend game because I look around at the shelf and I think like, oh, do I have that? And sometimes well, I don't. Time I've never seen Notting the Hill. shelf to your right. Can you move your camera so I can see it? A long time ago. Wait, which way? This way? I've never I've, seen. No, the, the way you were just looking. The movie you were just way. looking at. Oh, I've I got never a whole seen. Another, I got a whole oh, nother. I had ago. no idea. Oh, yeah. I got a whole nother wall of stuff over that. Oh, way. that's. I didn't know yeah. you had all that there. And behind wow. me and then that one over there. I knew behind you. Wow. <laughs> yeah, I know. I need to come up with a much better filing system, unfortunately. And, and one Don't last thing, Gabe. I'm talking about my physical media. I will add this one last thing. Um, I, Lauren and I did eventually get to visit that bookstore together as a couple later no! on, like years later. Oh, that's um, awesome. We went to Notting Hill. So that that movie just kind of it's weird because when I first saw it, it didn't have the same effect on me, even though I loved it when it first came out. But as a married man and kind of the movie it's become between Lauren and I now, it's a, it's that's my warm blanket. That's pretty funny. We Love stay it. in Mayfair a lot when we go for press in London. We used to. I don't know if we ever will again. And I, one of the first times we were there, I looked around the map of just like, all right, I'm in London for one of the first times. Let me go see what, and Notting Hill is just north of the Mayfair, uh, north and west. And I was like, oh, cool. I'm going to go check that out. And it looks just like the movie. Like, it's yeah. really sweet yeah. and charming. And it, yeah. the architecture is fantastic. Yeah. And uh, yeah, it's really, really sweet. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm going to go with uh, Ferris Bueller. I'm going to go with Ferris oh, Bueller's Day cool. Off. Oh, cool. You know, Josh um, Gad is that's his, that's the last uh, yes. reunited yeah, yeah. part. Yeah, and I don't necessarily want to see them together uh, anymore because, like, the idea of Ferris is, like, that's youth captured, yeah. you know? I don't want to see old Matthew Broderick. He still looks the same. No, he, I mean, he does and he, and he doesn't kind of thing. Um, you know, like, that movie just captures... I love John Hughes. I think the John Hughes films are fantastic. Uh, it was fun to talk to uh, the director of Pretty in Pink most recently because I like to sort of pick their brain about like, that genre was so massive for so long. And I can't for the life of me figure out. So I was able to introduce the uh, uh, interview, the director of a movie called Just One of the Guys recently. And I talked to her about that time frame, like the after Fast Times at Ridgemont High and after and during Breakfast Club and all those movies like Studios were snatching up anything teen related. Right. And I don't know why that genre doesn't work now. Like, why don't they make movies like if something like um, eighth grade comes out and everybody loves it or um, what, was so the one with, uh, what was the one with um, uh, the girl from <laughs> the girl from Bumblebee? Uh, what? Oh, hey, uh, 17, 17, the edge of 17, right? The and edge then, of 17. Uh, yeah. There's a lot of perks of being a wallflower. You know, we get like one every couple of years, but they used to be like they were the superhero movies, you know, of the 80s. And I don't understand why people don't tell Simon. That's a great one. That's a good one. But I and I I think part of it is that teenagers don't go to the movies as much as we did. You know, I think they're they're, I speak to my boys. They're not that invested in going to the movies. And so I'm not sure if this if they make movies that appeal to that demographic. The John Hughes movies to me are so perfect uh, they're so timeless. And Ferris is the one that I go to all the time because it's such a funny script. And I love Matthew Broderick in it. I love that it's just a loose structure of them bouncing around from thing to thing to thing. I think there was an article someone wrote that could you actually do all the things that he did in one day? 
Um, and some of them are over the top, like the parade where he gets on the float and sings the, the Beatles. And some of them are really, really funny where yeah. he, you know, pretends to be Abe Froman to get a reservation in a restaurant. But here's the this sausage happened, king of Chicago. <laughs> this this it's a great love letter to Chicago. It is. Absolutely. Um, but recently, um, PJ, that's become PJ's favorite movie. And he watches oh, really? it. Yeah. And he watches Wait, it. When did like you guys every watch it together? Couple of, well, we watched it together for the first time years ago and he really liked it. And now, like, since he stays up till all hours, he just puts on something in the background. And then the next morning he goes, hey, do you know what movie I watched last night? And I'm like, watch something with me. And he's like, nah, I don't I don't start it till like 12 or, or one o'clock. And so he'll be like, yeah, I watched Black Panther last night or, oh, I watched Endgame. It was really great. And he watches Ferris on the regular and we're at dinner and he goes, oh, yeah, I watched Ferris Bueller last night again. God, that movie's so funny. And then he goes, do you have a kiss for daddy? And then, like the way he said it just was such a nostalgic like slam. Like you hear a line and it's so funny to you um, that it brings you immediately back. And so I was torn between Back to the Future and Ferris, and I, I'm either, either, but um, I'll go with Ferris as my choice. That's um, what was the other? What was the third one? Toy Story Two, because of like I just remember watching it so many times uh, with the boys as they were kids, and so now when it's on, uh, as I go through any sort of scene about uh, from from Toy Story Two specifically, any of the Pixar films, but that I was going to go with Wally. Uh, I was thinking about Wally, but Toy Story Two, the Tom Hanks and Tim Allen are just so brilliant in it and and the lines in it are so funny and all of it's really, really great. This topic was amazing and to the point where uh, the audience reactions have been fantastic. So we wanted to carve out uh, some time to just read through some of the ones that people sent because they were really, really sweet and emotional. Uh, Victor Carpenter said, my pick for warm blanket blend is Return of the King. Me and my brother don't see eye to eye on a lot of stuff, but seeing all three of the movies and this one being the last one with him, I cried so much, especially at the end, not because it was over, but because we won't really ever get to share a moment like that again. Really, really sweet. Laura Oof. Morgan said, judging by the fact that I've watched it on every basic cable channel, it's aired on this week. Beetlejuice is my choice for Warm Blanket Blend. Uh, Kimberly Sue said pretty much the entire MCU is a warm blanket to me, but my pick for Warm Blanket Blend is Pride and Prejudice. Uh, that's one that I put on if I'm staying home sick on the couch, just the most comforting. John Palmer uh, says, I'm 43 years old and I've been watching A New Hope since the 1980s and just hearing the score makes me happy. John, you are absolutely not alone in that one. Joshua Crawford wrote and said, the movie that I always seem to put on when I need to feel like a nice warm blanket is Serendipity. That's a great story. Uh, I love the story and the relationships and it always hits close to my heart. I always feel comfortable and cozy watching that. I think that's the, one of the... One of the coolest, um, uh, John, what's his name? John, uh, John Cusack. Cusack. That's one of the best John Cusack uh, roles that gets completely underrated. Christian Hosta said, my entry for Warm Blanket Blend is School of Rock. My favorite movie from both Jack Black and Richard Linklater. Endlessly quotable, an amazing soundtrack, and with a final concert scene that warms my heart more than most things. And Michelle Garrist, who always writes really nice things to us and uh, participates in our blend games via email, she writes, I went with Moulin Rouge as my choice for Blanket Blend because it's the movie that got me through the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic. For the longest time, the ending of that movie would upset me and reduce me to tears, but that changed this spring. I am part of a research team responding to COVID-19 and I provide regulatory support for treatment and vaccine studies. During the beginning of this crisis, work involved a lot of long hours, work weekends and waking up in the middle of the night to respond to queries. When everyone was quarantined, I had the added pressure of homeschooling my child while working and trying to pass a grad school class. During March, April, and May, I would watch Moulin Rouge and the experience became cathartic. The emotions I experienced during the end of the movie was a release of all the frustrations I faced during that time. I watched it so much that it became a signal to my family of when I was stressed out. I apologize mm. for the long-winded message, but I really appreciated Gabe's topic for this week's blend game, and it's important to have that movie that makes you feel better after you watch it. Michelle, thank you, first off, for everything that you do. Uh, we are so thankful to have you out there, and thank you for sharing that story with us. That Amazing. was uh, one of the best of the responses that we received. Um, so much participation this week, obviously. Thank you guys all for playing on social media and for emailing us. For next week, we didn't even get to this topic because uh, there was so much stuff going on. But we are going to be playing uh, hashtag Joel Schumacher blend. We lost Joel oh, Schumacher this awesome. week. 
And we didn't get a chance to discuss in depth about his uh, contributions to the film community. So let's do it next week when we can single out our very favorite Joel Schumacher films using hashtag. So many Joel good ones. Schumacher blind. A ton. So many of really good ones good to ones. choose from. All right. A review. Uh, this review comes from Curvin21, who writes as a subject line Goodbye, Collider Movie Talk. Hello, Real Blend. <laughs> if you are someone who has missed the old school Collider Movie Talk days, well, guess what? This is the show to fill in that gap. Sean, Kevin, Jake, and Gabe do a phenomenal job of bringing the latest movie news, box office updates, reviews, and great interviews. But better than that, they are a group of friends who just love to talk about movies. Even when they disagree, they're having a fun time. Their fascination with making cheesy movie-related puns will always bring a smile to your face. Their love for movies and getting to interview actors, directors, and writers feels absolutely authentic. In an age where there is so much cynicism around movies and the film industry, these guys bring a breath of fresh air for anyone who just wants to have fun talking about how enjoyable movies can really be. Thank you very much, Curvin21. And I will say, we like the Collider Movie Talk folks. They're good friends of ours. Uh, to the point where Perry Nemiroff heard our story about the uh, origin line for Hold On To Your Butts and wrote a really nice story over on Collider and texted me uh, how excited she was <laughs> to hear that it was Bob Zemeckis who gave that line to David Kep, which is amazing. Go back and listen to that intro if you have not again. Okay. Reminder, now that we're at the end of the show, we have a merch store that you can go and buy Real Blend t-shirts, mugs, uh, tote bags, and do me a favor, read the descriptions for each item, because Gabe and I worked really hard on the uh, the funny descriptions for each of them. So go to cinemablend.com backslash shop and pick up some stuff, and then as you guys start to get it, please do us a favor, take a picture and share it on social media so we can see you rocking your real blend merch i've loved all the photographs that we've gotten of people wearing the shirts from the uh charity drive uh you can, oh, find can we give us. a shout out to our listener that created such an amazing fan poster oh, for us yeah yeah thank you very much that is um juan carlos espinoza from bogota colombia who uh jake has it on his instagram it's a, a real blend poster that is it has it's, it's amazing selections too it's, it's jake awesome. with stan lee um it's me with my smolder from my rome trip Kevin's got a film reel behind him, which is very uh, on brand for Kevin. Uh, and it's Sean, a Dunkirk you, film are reel. Are you passing gas in that left that left one? The the, the yeah. Which I'm, one are you I'm passing bringing, gas in? You can probably say that that's what I'm doing. Sure. I just think I'm heroically <laughs> ready to save the world with my opinions on on movies, basically, Kev. And then I'll, uh, for, for people for people watching on YouTube, I'll I'll pop the graphic in on the edit. Oh, so you good, very nice. You don't like yeah. you don't like Jake holding it up to the screen with the glare. No, it works. You it think works. That, that's a... But I'll I'll pop it on there so you can also, see. Also, someone had a great comment. They said when I uh, finally saw Gabe on that poster, it was like when I spotted Hawkeye on one of the Avengers posters. <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's like tiny and off to the side. And someone battle on and oh well, I guess I guess it was Juan Carlos who battle on <laughs> Gabe from the Tarantino picture. <laughs> I mean, like, yeah. well, it breaks Wait, my is that like a, that battle Easter on egg? Egg? means something. Yes, now. that is an Easter egg. Yes, there's hey, a he, shot of he, he genuinely battle on them like as a joke? Well, I don't know. I it, don't know. Oh, I wonder. That's a good question. I'll I'll, I'll, I'll DM him and ask him if it's a an intentional battle on. We got to get so. battle on on the show. Yeah, that would be great. And then and then battle on him and like not use it. <laughs> <laughs> we just only have you guys asking questions yeah. Yeah. and then not have his. Well, answer. We, do the, we do the Kimmel it? Matt Damon. Like, <laughs> sorry, we ran out of time. <laughs> yeah, right. One of my well, favorite I'm, bits. <laughs> remember, remember what's up with that? They would have like a guest on the show, oh, and they I, would yeah. never get to Bill Hader. <laughs> <laughs> so. oh, oh, all right, man. listen, we'll be back at this next week. Um, you know where to find us on social media, and uh, hopefully, we'll have some more news about theaters opening and us getting close to tenants, so that we can start yelling a new Christopher Nolan title. But until then, Dunkirk. <laughs>